Good evening. I am Sir Frankfurt Falafel, and I am here to share with you all a story inspired from Muslim apologists using the Bible to tell the story about their favorite prophet, Muhammad. This was written by me, Sir Frankfurt Falafel. And this is how the story goes. Muhammad was once a king of Israel's son. He was also his silver and his gold and his women. The king of Samaria had vowed to take Muhammad away from Israel and possess him for himself. This troubled the king of Israel, but he agreed, seeing that Samaria had great strength and power. However, Yahweh sent a messenger to inform the king of Israel that this would not happen, when in fact, Yahweh said that Samaria would fall under the foot of Israel. So the king, following Yahweh's order, sent out his soldiers. They routed the Samarians. Muhammad was saved as the possession of Israel. Hundreds of years later after that, Muhammad was then identified as Solomon's sweet and lovely mouth. So sweet, so lovely, so Muhammad deem. Then hundreds of years after that sweet, lovely mouth of Solomon Muhammad, he again turns up in the Bible to be burned along with the holy temple of God. Muhammad was destroyed and turned into ruins. Muhammad was then stretched out and his sanctuary was entered by the enemy against his will. The Lord was displeased with Muhammad and bent his bow like an enemy towards him. The Lord poured out his anger upon Muhammad and stretched out his right hand against him and slayed him as a foe. And finally, poor, sweet, lovely silver and gold, women, son of the king of Israel, Muhammad. He did meet a better end under the wrathful judgment of God. And that's, wait a minute, there's more to the story. Muhammad is alive once again, but lo, only to be slain once more under the wrath of Ezekiel, who did not mourn for him or her. Muhammad was slain twice and reincarnated once again, only to be plundered and taken away and buried once more. Muhammad is almost born again, but lo, he was slain in his mother's womb. And poor, sweet, lovely, silver and gold Muhammad, it was never heard from again. Or was he? Marvel at the proclamation of Zakir Naik, the 21st century Muslim scholar. He proclaimed that this Muhammad is his prophet from the 7th century and that we can know about him because the Bible calls him by name. But Twain to ponder, I must wonder, whatever happened to poor, sweet, lovely, silver and gold Muhammad? What happened to him in the 7th century? Well, as fate would have it, he was poisoned by a Jewess and died a long, painful, and agonizing death. This was told, of course, to us by his child bride, Aisha, who said that Muhammad claimed that he felt as if 
his aorta was being severed. And then, shortly after, he died. The end. Thank you for sitting with me today. My name is Frankfurt, Sir Frankfurt Falafel. Enjoy your evenings. All right. Very interesting material there, yeah. don't you think? No, I, I, I thought it was, and uh, I had a chance to um, message him, uh, Sir Frankfurt Falafel, and try to understand what and why he was reading, uh, saying that Muhammad was all of these different characters. I had no clue what, what he was talking about. And eventually he explained it to me, Thaddeus. Uh, I had never heard this before. Uh, apparently, uh, words have meaning. Um, and especially in Semitic languages, uh, there's root words and things like that. And, and so he was very inspired by Zakir Naik, uh, from, from what I understood. And he was inspired to see, you know, here is this character, Muhammadin, who has been prophesied in the Bible in the Song of Solomon 516. From Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16, which says, Hikko Mamitakim, Vikulli Muhammadim, Zaidudi Zairai Baina Jerusalem. Which means, Sister only translated one word, it means he's more sweet, he's altogether lovely, he's my beloved, he's my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the complete translation of the Hebrew verse. She quoted. And, uh, you know, so apparently he went on a search to to figure out, you know, what does this word mean? Uh, is it used any other way, shape or form throughout the Bible? And then he discovered that it was an, indeed used 12 times in the Bible, kind of throughout the scriptures. And uh, I did take notes and I'll, I'll get into them a little bit. And as it turns out, uh, you know, him being a super creative genius uh author, writer, and narrator. He uh, put together all of the different stories from out, like throughout the Bible, uh, all the different contexts, and wove them together masterfully, if I might add, that, uh, you know, uh, masterfully so that we would understand more truly this character from Song of Solomon 5.16, whom Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat and a lot of other Muslim apologists proclaim is Muhammad, who is mentioned by name in the Torah and the Injil. The story of this character mm -hmm. is found throughout the Bible, uh, you know, and was under the impression that he was only in Song of Solomon, but apparently that's not correct yeah. if we actually take the argument seriously mm -hmm. and we look at all of the Old Testament and a few other places as well. Uh, so we, we get a, a complete story, if you will, uh, about this particular individual, which is prophesized apparently by the Old Testament prophets. Mm-hmm. I think we'll get to look yeah. a little bit, you know, more at that as we go along here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll kind of jump into a little bit of the meat of it. Typically, at this point in time, I'm going to open up my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of deep insights into this. Uh, that's not how this is going to go today. Um, we're going to use the story from Sir Frankfurt Falafel. And uh, I think, honestly, the story speaks for itself. It is completely absurd. It is strange, and it makes uh, exactly zero sense whatsoever, but the Muslim apologists are going to go with that, right? So we're going to first back up, and we're going to review why it is that we are doing what we are doing. The first reason why we are doing what we're doing is because the Quran says explicitly in chapter 7, ayah 157, that we can read about this unlettered prophet whom all the Muslims identify as being Muhammad. We can read about him, present tense, in the scriptures, written about in the scriptures, meaning there was a writing written that the 
uh, Muslims at the time of Revelation between 610 and 632 AD would be able to go to, and they could challenge the Christians and the Jews and say, look, within your Torah and within your Injil, there is a man named Muhammad described in great detail. Even the Tafsir uh, Jalalain says by name specifically. Now, I believe that's the only Tafsir I'm aware of that says by name. But, uh, you know, Ahmed Didat and Zachary Knight took that very seriously. And they did find him written by name in the Torah and the Injil. But we got to really think specifics here. And we covered this at the end of our last, uh, our, our last video. The Torah is a very specific thing. The Torah is the book, according to the Quran, according to Islamic sources, the book that was written by God's right hand and given to Moses. Okay, so the book, the Torah, right, is the book given to Moses written by God's right hand. I like to ask some somewhat rhetorical questions, Thaddeus, and I like to make you feel awkward in answering <laughs> rhetorical sure questions. Okay. The book that Allah gave to someone, what was that someone's name? Uh, well, I guess that might depend on which book. The Torah. I'm sorry. The Torah that was given. Who was it given to? What was the name that of that prophet? Moses. Okay. Here in this disputed passage, we see in the book called The Song of Solomon. Um, I'm not real bright. Thaddeus, help me, please. When Moses was handed the book of the law, which is what the Torah means, law, um, was it ever named? Was he ever named? Was anyone ever named Solomon during, you know, was it, was Moses, is Moses Solomon is my question. No, I, I believe they're different figures. You think they're different figures? Roughly, help, help, help me here. How many years are in between Solomon and Moses approximately? Uh, going off the top of my head, I think it's like about 600 years or so. Yeah, they say five to seven hundred, so six hundred is just about right. So there's a six hundred year gap between the Torah, right? The law that was written and given to Moses and this book called the Song of Solomon. So right away, we have a little bit of an issue. And the issue is pretty apparent. I walked through it slowly for you guys. The issue is really apparent. This is not the Torah. Are there any laws given? for instruction, Thaddeus, in the Song of Solomon? Can you think of any, uh, Israel, you must do X, Y, and Z? Or are there any laws given in no, definitely the not. Song of Solomon? So it's not a single law given in the Song of Solomon. And yet, in Surah 7, Ayah 157, it says that you can find Muhammad written about in the scriptures that are with the Jews and the Christians. And it names them specifically in the verse, the Torah, and the Injil, which is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Is the Song of Solomon the Torah? No. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we're going to jump to Sahih al-Bukhari 6614. Um, yeah. But this is proof that the book, the Torah, the law, was given to Moses. So this is Sahih Bukhari 6614. The prophet said, Adam and Moses argued with each other. Moses said to Adam, Oh, Adam, you are our father who disappointed us and turned us out of paradise. Then Adam said to him, Oh, Moses, Allah favored you with his talk, talk directly. And he wrote the Torah for you with his own hand. Okay, now this is an, an amazingly problematic verse for Muslims, but we're not going to dive into that part. I just want to focus on the, oh, Moses, Allah favored you with this talk, talk to you directly, and he wrote the Torah for you with his own hand. So it's pretty simple. The Torah was written for Moses with his own hand. 
So this is where the burden of proof lies, not with us as Christians, not with the Jews. It lies exactly with the Muslims. So this is what they have to prove. They have to prove uh, how Moses wrote the Song of Solomon, or for uh, Isaiah, for that matter. And it's a mystery so great, Thaddeus, that only Allah knows best. Allahu Alam, right? Although... I don't have any faith in the Islamic Allah, uh, but I do have a sneaking suspicion that the knowledge of Allah is somewhat limited by the knowledge of a man named Muhammad. And that's a little bit besides the point. So Muslims are not going to be able to coherently explain how the Song of Solomon is a book of law since it contains no commandments, like we already talked about, Thaddeus, nor will they be able to, be able to explain how Moses time-traveled uh, and wrote the Song of Solomon, but they will at least attempt to describe the phrase altogether lovely. Um, so they believe that the Hebrew word altogether lovely is Muhammad's name in Hebrew. However, they will not address that the Hebrew word akbar, as in Allahu Akbar, means mouse in Hebrew. And they won't address the glaring inconsistency of their application when it comes to holding same standards or being consistent whatsoever in any of their semantic arguments. So the phrase altogether lovely is pronounced mahmadim. Okay, so if you don't mind, Thaddeus, going to uh, Bible Hub, Song of Solomon, and the Linear, chapter 5, verse 16. I had a feeling you had that pulled up. Go ahead for me, Thaddeus, and click on not the number above Muhammadim, but the actual, yeah, the, the actual uh, Muhammadim, right? So if you can click on that for us and zoom in, it will show you. How it's used in that particular phrase, it's used one time, and it means desirable or altogether lovely. Okay, going back into it, um, I do want to say this Thaddeus, does Muhammadim or Mahamadim, however you pronounce it, does that sound similar to Muhammadim? Uh, I mean, a little. Right, it's close enough. It sounds like Muhammad but just with like the M kind of behind it, but you kind of get that thing as well. So it's, it's Mahmadim. Um, so the, in the he, Hebraic and Arabic languages, uh, they're similar because they're both Semitic languages. And one of the ways that they construct their words and put them into sentences is, is by using root words. And so in this case, the root word of Mahmadim is Mahmad. So if you go back uh, one space for me, sir, and then click on the number above that, the 4,000, whatever, whatever it is. All right. So you can kind of scroll through, zoom in on that. So Mahmad, the Hebrew word, the root word of this is Mahmad, which means desire or desired or desirable thing. Mahmad occurs 12 times in the Old Testament. Guess how many times it occurs in the books attributed to Moses? I'm going to guess zero. You, you guessed correctly, sir. Um, so in no way, shape, or form does the books attributed to Moses ever use this root word, let alone the Mahmadim selection here. Okay, so it occurs 12 times. And uh, we talked about how Sir Frankfurt Falafel was inspired by the Islamic argument, and he drew all of the, his, his book and his writing from using the root word Mahmad. It was indeed a challenging task, so I hear from Sir Frankfurt Falafel, because as we find out, Mahmad is never actually one thing. 
So as you can see on the top right part of your screen under where it says Englishman's Concordance, that is if you want to zoom in on that. So we'll go to 1 Kings. You don't need to click on it, but 1 Kings 20, verse 6. When you read this passage in context, what you see is that everything that the king of Israel owns or considers valuable, which is King Ahab at the time, uh, that is Mahmad. That is the root word used, Mahmad. Whatever is desirable in your eyes, uh, the king of Samaria promises to take away from him, to plunder from him. And at first, when you read the story from Mr. Frank Falafel, um, you realize that uh, Yahweh actually turns the Sumerians away. However, that is what they were going after. And very specifically in this passage, uh, it says exactly what is valuable, right? So the English word valuable is actually Mahmad. So what is specifically and explicitly laid out as valuable throughout this passage is silver, gold, wives, and children, right? And wives is plural, by the way. So quite literally, if we're going to be applying the same standards that Muslims use for uh, Song of Solomon 516 and applying it throughout the rest of Scripture like we ought to, quite literally it means that Mahmad or Muhammad is silver. It quite literally means that Mahmad is gold. Mahmad is a plural wives, multiple wives. Apparently he is multiple personality disorder, which actually might be be a prophecy. And Mahmad is also children, right? So Mahmad is not one thing. It's literally just describing something. It's just a word that means desirable or desirable thing. In the next occurrence, if you scroll down to Second Chronicles 36, 19, it refers to everything of value inside of Jerusalem. And what happened to all of those valuable things that were inside of Jerusalem, Thaddeus? Uh, I think that they were plundered or destroyed, something like that. They were plundered, destroyed, explicitly burned down, including the temple, which was considered Mahmud, or Muhammad, I guess, if we're just going to insert his name, right? Because if it's a name, it's a name, and it's a name, right? It doesn't matter any other constructs of it. It's a name. So the next occurrence of the passage is what we saw. So when you scroll down, you see 516, right? And so the context of this is the author, the one who is writing the Song of Solomon, which is attributed to Solomon. The explicit context of this is talking about Solomon's sweet and lovely mouth. So if Muslims want to describe... Muhammad as Solomon's sweet and lovely mouth. Uh, I suppose they could do that, but when they do that, they're also going to have to describe him as a child, as wives, i.e. multiples, as silver, as gold. And they also have to accept that he was plundered, pillaged, and burned to the ground. Now, there are a whole bunch of other passages mm -hmm. if you just want to scroll through those for us, Thaddeus. We got Isaiah 64.11. Lamentations 1.10, Lamentations 2.4, Ezekiel 24.16, 24.21, 24.25, 6, Hosea 9.16, and Joel 3.5. When you guys take your time to go through this, you can read about it. Go into your favorite Bible translation. Read the context of the passage. This is where Frankfurt, at least I'm told, Frankfurt Falafel got his idea from to create the Muhammad story. So we read that Mah uh, Mahmud is burned. He is the burned down temple. He is also Jerusalem who has been violated. He is also the youth of Jerusalem who were killed. He is Ezekiel's wife who dies. He is the temple of security and pride that was destroyed. And he is also Israel's sons and daughters that were slaughtered. Yeah, I, I'm so, I'm not seeing any problem. I mean, this I is wanna, all completely yeah. consistent with Islamic theology, right? It is, and that's why that's why I I mean not I, that's why Frankfurt Sir Frankfurt Falafel threw in the part at the very end, right? So if all of these characters are the one character, Muhammad, first of all, there's a bunch of reincarnation that's happening throughout the Islamic ideas. Um, and there's a lot of 
punishment going on and destruction going on to Muhammad. And then as, as fate would have it, Muhammad was actually destroyed by a Jewish woman who fed him poisoned lamb. Oddly enough, he uh, in, uh, took up her invite to come and have dinner with him after he and his soldiers literally, quite literally, slain her entire family and village. He decided that it was a good idea to go have dinner with this woman. And one of my favorite stories in history, this is like better than Looney Tunes. <laughs> he sits down at the table. Okay, and remember, he's Allah's favorite, favorite prophet, Thaddeus. <laughs> and he takes a bite of this leg of lamb, right? And then, this is how much Allah loved him. And then Allah revealed to him that the leg of lamb was poisoned after he had already tasted it, right? Um, and then he cries out to his poor child bride, Aisha, who was about 18 at the time. They had been married um, for, well, I guess they had been married via consummation for, uh, what, nine years. And he tells her that he feels as if his aorta is being severed. I know we're getting off on a tangent, but I'm almost done with the whole thing. So we're going to go yeah. on red herrings here, Thaddeus. Mm -hmm. Fun question for you. If, if Muhammad, let's just say, I know it's impossible, but if Muhammad were a false prophet, if he were to deliver false revelations, is there any indication in the Quran what would happen to him if he did, if he was just some guy yeah well making the up uh, multiple gods who is actually one god uh, i'm referring to the fact that he says we mm -hmm. he says we would surely <laughs> uh, seize you by the right hand and cut off your aorta if you were making up verses and putting them in our mouth hmm. and then how did he die well according to his own words he felt that his aorta was being cut. But if he was a false prophet, what would happen to him? He would have his aorta cut. But but he's a true prophet, right? <laughs> because, hear me out, hear me out. How would he have known? Only a true prophet would know that if they were a false prophet, <laughs> that they'd be proven as a true prophet <laughs> if they died the way that they said they would die, if they were a false prophet. So that made him a true prophet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean that that <laughs> prophecy there that that was pretty good. Um, so, uh, as the Muslim Muslim apologists say, right, Muhammad is mentioned by name. That means Mahmud is a name, is a name, is a name, right? And so, all of the other stories that we just read about him, that also has to be him, as we've just read and as we've just heard. It is incoherent and nonsensical to hold that position on the account of how absurd that story actually was about Muhammad as being this character who's time traveling throughout, you know, Israel and, and going into Arabia and dying all of these crazy tragic deaths and shape shifting into silver and shape shifting into gold and shape shifting into a woman or a child, or even one of them, he was an unborn child who was, who was killed as well. Um, you know, so it's just the level of inconsistency that Muslims really don't want to take, right? So if it is about Muslim, that just, or, uh, sorry, if it is about Muhammad, that just means that he was destroyed over and over and over again throughout the centuries and millennia. Um, and that at the end, he is not resurrected since the Jewish woman poisoned him to death. He is still dead since then and being tortured in the grave and uh, under the feet of Jesus Christ, uh, judged burning in hell. That's my opinion and the opinion of a lot of others. However, if, and again, we've been as charitable as we possibly can be with uh, Muslims on this. Uh, if we are being charitable, I would just give some advice to the Muslims. Muslims are right. Look, there are arguments that you can use, right? We've debunked Deuteronomy 18, 18. We've debunked Deuteronomy 32. And this one is quite laughably 
debunkable within minutes about the sweet, lovely mouth of Solomon and his wild journey throughout history uh, and always being punished, by the way. So if, if I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim apologist, I'm not going to use this argument. And in fact, it is so embarrassing to try to use this argument that I would go around campaigning against other Muslim <laughs> apologists for ever using this. Because when you hear this, it makes you go, what are you talking about? And it makes you just want to turn away from Islam altogether because of the arguments being made by their apologists. So my sincere advice to Muslim apologists, don't use this one. Don't use Deuteronomy 32. It didn't work well for you unless you want to commit shirk. And don't use Deuteronomy 18.18 18, unless you're willing to agree that Moses would have uh, stoned Muhammad to death for revealing false revelations and not having any prophecies come true. Otherwise, hold on to hope, even though there is no hope for you anymore, because as we established, the Torah is done. The Torah was done with, with, with Deuteronomy. Song of Solomon is not written by Moses. It was not a book given to Moses. In fact, it says in its name that it's not Moses. It says Solomon.